Hey everybody, welcome to another welcome to another episode of Versi Headlines. Uh, today we're going to talk East Africa and um, ancient DNA that again tells the story of the early herders and farmers and agriculturalists of uh, East Africa. And I thought this is really, really interesting and it kind of ties in and supports the last video that I did, or one of the last videos, uh, within the last three for sure, that I did about... Um, that relate, related to early settlers and early civilization and stuff like that. And how through th uh, these population movements that they're seeing... Oh, I remember that was on the Trojan War or the or Troy and Katahoyuk. That's just an example of what I'm talking about, the, the population movements that they're seeing that is indicative of some early knowledge and organization and order, uh, meaning an order in which they were organized in communities and they were living off the land. This study is a collaborative effort between archaeologists, geneticists, and hu uh, museum curators. They were basically analyzing ancient DNA from uh, 41 skeletons which were curated in these museums. So one of the co-authors, she says, the origins of food producers in East Africa have remained elusive because of gaps in the archaeological record. Yeah, there's not much known about places like this. So. Um, Here's a picture of the Rift Valley in Tanzania. Very, very interesting place. It's been um, home all kinds of species and all kinds of uh, people for a long, long, long time. And Ethiopia as well, Kenya. So this is where, this is the region that they're talking about in, in, the, in the article. They wanted to find out how people were moving and interacting back then as most uh, scientists do. Um, I did a similar video on population movement in the uh, um, near modern day Mo uh, Armenia and um, Azerbaijan um, and of course Turkey and it was the same deal they were uh, tracking these uh, movements from finding out their genetic makeup another uh, PhD she's a bioarchaeologist so from this study there's a lot of hands in the pot here so they're and they're not wearing the same hat either they're all from different disciplines so this has been a pretty comprehensive and thorough study uh coming at it from all angles so she says that east africa is one of the most genetically linguistically and culturally diverse places in the world and that is true it's been there for ever and there have been so many people coming in coming through that area it, it, it's just natural that it would be a source of all this new information uh, our findings trace the roots of this mosaic back several millennia. Um, the distinct peoples have coexisted in the Rift Valley for a very long time. So th again, that's why East Africa is so uh, talked about in ancient texts. In all kinds of scripture, the, the East Africa is always mentioned somewhere. And that is, again, because there's a long history of people, not just nomadic people, but people with uh, the knowledge, I guess you would say, of property and the, co the concept of property and land and and management and and all of these uh, not to mention agriculture and laws and stuff like that Th these people or the people who had that in mind they were among the first in in east africa east africa was among the first places where they were congregating and doing you know living out their settler lives right N not even settlers they were just uh, civilized people um, previous archaeology shows that the Great Rift Valley of Kenya and Tanzania was a key site for the transition from foraging to herding. I talked about this in, in the Katahuya video, so Gobekli Tepe, uh, assuming that that's the center of all the agriculture knowledge and, and cultivation and all that stuff, I was talking about the, the transitions and how um, the people there, it, it seemed like there wasn't much of a transition or if there was, there's no evidence left of it because, or there's very little because of the the houses that they had. There's there was some. Um, I, I showed some pictures of of what the uh, pictures, I mean, of what the houses would have looked like back 7,000 or so uh, BC, and it looked like it was a very structured city. It was there was some level of planning going on there, and then not to mention I talked about the middens and and trash heaps. So they were living in one spot because they had trash heaps that was accumulating over the years and then yeah it was a poop video you guys can that, that i think that was either the last video or two videos ago so anyway in tanzania it, the story is a little bit different they they think that it took there was some sort of process that went 
uh, that took place in East Africa in which herders started replacing the, the local um, uh, foragers and hunter-gatherers. So they first appeared in northern Kenya around 5,000 years ago, which is interesting because if they came in from uh, the Fertile Crescent area, then that would make sense if you were to look at it from a timeline. So for example, Gobekli Tepe is up here. Civilization, uh, civilizing principles are born from the education is born from there. And then that's, let's say 10,000, whatever, wh however old it is, 10,000 years ago. And then it, you go down and then eventually when they hit the Horn of Africa, it would be around seven, six, even 5,000 years ago. But I think it might be older than that. I think there's probably more uh, evidence there that they haven't found. And they're going by uh, cemeteries that they found, mass graves, uh, whatever it was, pastoral Neolithic uh, graves. Genetic results reveal that this spread of herding into Kenya and Tanzania evol involved groups of ancestry derived from Northeast Africa. Again, that's, we're talking about like Egypt who appeared in East Africa and mixed with local foragers there between uh, 4,500 and 3,500 years ago. That's interesting. Think about what was going on back then. So that was about 2,500 BC. That's right when the pyramids were allegedly built. So 4,500 years ago. That's like the, that's the date um, that they're giving. So it, alle allegedly, that's when uh, the Egyptian pharaohs were living and, and we're talking about the old kingdom. That is during this time. So those people concurrent with the Egyptians were just come, going from local foraging to uh, uh, herding. That's very interesting, but it's also kind of hard to believe too. I feel like maybe um, there's more to that story. But anyway, the origins and timing of these population shifts were unclear. And some archaeologists hypothesize that domestic animals spread through exchange networks rather than by movement of people. That might be true as well. I mean, if they had exchange networks, then um, think about, again, what it took to get to that point of having exchange networks that spread pretty far, as far as the Horn of, uh, or East Africa. So then the story goes, uh, foragers became genetically isolated in East Africa, even though they continued to live side by side. Um, archaeologists have hypothesized a uh, substantial interaction among foraging and herding groups, but the new results reveal that there were strong and persistent social barriers. Interesting. Yeah, so they didn't mix to get their populations didn't mix largely because there was so, some s societal thing. And that would make sense if you have an influx of people who have completely different values, completely different culture than the people who had already been living there who are the hunter got the local hunter gathers yeah i could see how there would be a huge issue they wouldn't be amiable r right away i could see that as a possibility so these strong and persistent social barriers r could more than likely just be defense mechanisms uh, that just came naturally to the do two different populations because it's kind of like inv an invasions going on although um there's been wars fought and stuff but i'm just talking about the initial ideas of civilizing ideas coming in into that part of Africa and there are probably all kinds of uh, conflicts as well e even just assuming let's just assume that there was no violent conflict between them the social barriers it's still that's still a huge deterrent from absorbing people into um, organized society uh, another major genetic shift occurred during the Iron Age around 1200 years ago with movement into the region of additional peoples from northeastern and western Africa. So yeah, <clears throat> more more people started coming in um, and it might largely have to do, there might be a bunch of factors, maybe climate might be a huge one. Because um, remember, this is after, the when the Green Sahara was around about five, 6,000 years ago, if off the top of my head, um, as it was shrinking, those people had to go somewhere. So they spread in all directions, pretty much. So yeah, it does make sense. It is consistent with, um, with uh, these genetic movements. These groups contributed to ancient an ancestry profiles similar to those of many East Africans today. The genetic shift parallels two major cultural changes, farming and iron working. Yeah, so an influx of uh, technology. And then with that comes from, it comes with like cultural values, tradi traditions, all that stuff gets warped to some degree when uh, new uh, uh, innovations come out. 
even today, look at the smartphone. The smartphone has warped society as we knew it from when the first one came out in 2007, 2008. Think about 2005, two years before that, and think about now. I mean, it, the culture has completely shifted, and that is largely because of an influx of innovation. So I don't see why that wouldn't happen back then with ironworking. A uh, study provided insight into the history of East Africa as an independent center of evolution of lactase persistence, which enables people to digest milk into adulthood. That's interesting. This genetic adaptation is found in high proportions among Kenyan and Tanzanian her herders today. Yeah, that makes sense. So again, this is an idea of literally a, a biological bookmark within our genetic code of this external uh, cultural ideological shift in consciousness so what i'm trying to say is if you were an individual who's who was a pastoral or or a herder then those decisions and those beliefs that you have as a herder will tr assuming that you have a wife and you have kids and and you procreate and they procreate it makes sense that they would develop a genetic adaptation to in this case lactase persistence there are a ton of people who are lactose intolerant but the the gene for lactase pers persistence being found among families of herders that's not a coincidence that is um that is an adaptation so um that ma that makes total sense to me uh, let me know what you guys think in the comments about society the uh how a, a society back then that adopted agriculture would have interacted with a hunter gatherer of 7,000, 10,000 years ago, whatever. Um, and yeah, let me know in the comments and this will be up on BitChute too. Uh, I got a few comments about um, uh, people finding out about my channel through BitChute and not YouTube. So I thought that's pretty cool. And uh, yeah, anyway, uh, let me know what you guys think and I'll have a video for you guys later this weekend.